A thousand years ago, men believed that the earth was flat. 500 years ago, men believed that the earth was the center of the universe and that the sun, moon, and stars all circled the earth. 200 years ago, men believed that it was impossible for stones to fall from the sky because there are no stones in the sky. Meteorites, they argued, were merely stones on earth that had been struck by lightning. 100 years ago, men believed that man could never fly. Bishop Wright said that flying was reserved for the angels. His two sons, Wilbur and Orville, later proved their father wrong. 50 years ago, Sir Harold Spencer Jones, the director of the Greenwich Observatory, predicted that man would never set foot on the surface of the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. 30 years ago, stories about UFOs circling the globe and landing on this planet were considered hoaxes or hallucinations. Yet more than 15 million witnesses, equipped with photographs, movies, videos, physical records, and scientific data, have proven, again, that man can be wrong. Most people today envision UFOs to be exactly as they are portrayed in most science fiction films and books. This is, of course, a relatively recent conception. It has been stimulated, perhaps, by our expanding knowledge of outer space. But strange sights appeared in the skies long before space flight or manned flight of any kind was possible. And in each century, these visions took on identities that tell much about the world view of those who saw them. Alexander the Great and his army, for instance, were harassed by a pair of flying objects in 329 BC. Most of the soldiers fled the scene, but some of the hardier men stood their ground and tried to hit the disc with their arrows and with stones from their slings. In 1492, just four hours before discovering land, Christopher Columbus saw a bright glowing object come out of the sky, go into the water, and travel slowly through the water very close to the ship that he was on. Engraved onto a French token minted in the 1860s is a disc-shaped flying object that experts say may have commemorated a daytime UFO sighting. The great British astronomer Edmund Halley of Comet fame also saw a series of unexplained aerial objects in March of 1716. One of them lit up the sky for more than two hours and was so brilliant that Halley could read a printed text by its light. There were sightings in 1897 of a lighter than air ship that had propellers, porthole windows, and brilliant searchlights, which it directed at the ground. In 1917, what may have been the largest crowd ever to witness a UFO occurred in Fatima, Portugal. 50,000 people watched in amazement as a huge silver disc began spinning like a windmill and dancing about in the sky. After plunging toward the earth, it climbed back into the sky and disappeared into the sun. One night during the summer of 1948, Clyde W. Tombaugh, the astronomer who discovered the planet Pluto, was sitting in the back of his home at Las Cruces, New Mexico. He and several witnesses, including other members of his family, watched a strange glowing craft move overhead. All of the witnesses agreed that the object was definitely a solid ship and that it was probably some form of extraterrestrial device. World War II Allied Air Force pilots reported UFO sightings over Germany. They appeared out of nowhere and seemed to be toying with the aircraft. Military pilots turned them Foo Fighters, Foo being the French word for fire. Retired Air Force Major Paul Deutsch describes an encounter with his crew over Japan. The particular one that my crew saw was uh, an orange-red color, and it paced our aircraft for miles and miles uh, off the left horizontal stabilizer. We don't know how far off. It's very difficult to determine. And so the top gunner who had control of all the guns in the 
back of this B-29 bomber uh, fired a burst. The tracers were seen to go directly toward it, but nothing happened. It's at that time that I saw it. We thought it was a Japanese secret device, probably developed by the Germans. And I might add that the fellows over in the European theater thought it was a German device, and the Germans thought it was an Allied secret weapon, and everybody thought it was somebody else's. No one knew what it was. On December 5th, 1945, a squadron of five Avenger torpedo bombers with 14 experienced crew members flew out of Fort Lauderdale Naval Air Station in Florida. It was a short routine flight. Each plane had a full load of fuel and weather conditions were excellent. But something strange happened. The flight leader called in and reported not having any sense of direction. Air control then ordered the squadron to head due west. The leader, with alarm in his voice, then said, we don't know which way is west. Everything is wrong, strange. We can't be sure of any direction. Even the ocean doesn't look as it should. He then stated that weird, unidentified aircraft were closing in on them. His radio went dead. All five planes disappeared without leaving a trace. A giant Martin Mariner with a crew of 13 was dispatched to search for the five missing planes. It had the capability to land on the roughest of seas, but this plane also disappeared into the grim silence of the Atlantic. What followed was the greatest search operation in history. For five days, an armada of 300 planes and 21 ships crisscrossed the sea and sky, but no trace of the six aircraft or 27 crew members were to be found. To this day, it remains a mystery as to what happened. Some believe the mystery may be found in the UFO phenomenon, wherein lie a number of questions. Could UFOs possibly be real? If so, what intelligent forces are behind them? What are their intentions? Are they hostile, friendly, or merely curious? Where do they come from? Do they originate on Earth, or do these machines and creatures come from somewhere out among those mysterious winking stars in the black vastness of space? Orson Welles comments. The discovery of just one bacteria on Mars or any other body of the solar system would indicate that the whole chain of evolutions, cosmic, chemical, and biological, is at work everywhere. In that case, the creation of life anywhere in the universe would be more the rule than the exception. In that case, there may be other intelligent civilizations capable of communicating with us. The dream of this so-called natural event began on October 12, 1992, when NASA's SETI program, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, began a 10-year, $100 million project whose sole purpose is to seek the answer to a single question. Is man alone in the universe? The centerpiece of the SETI program is the Arecibo radio telescope in Puerto Rico. Its 1,000-foot-wide antenna dish makes it the most powerful telescope in the world with the effective power of 20 trillion watts is manned by more than 100 physicists, astronomers, computer programmers, and technicians who are staring at control panels in hopes of discovering radio waves that were created by intelligent beings. But why all of this special attention to the search of intelligent life beyond Earth? Some would argue that it is the byproduct of what has become known as the modern flying saucer era, which began on June 24, 1947. Kenneth Arnold, a 32-year-old Boise, Idaho businessman, was flying his single-engine plane over the Cascade Mountains of Washington. Arnold tells his story. I had to reach the altitude of about 9,200 feet when a very brilliant flash uh, uh, lit the sky around me and, and, and actually lit up the airplane that I was flying. And uh, I could see way off to the right, uh, coming in the vicinity of Mount Baker, uh, a whole chain-like string of very, uh, of aircraft coming at a tremendous speed. I, I could see plainly that 
They didn't have any tails. I had never seen aircraft of that kind. And uh, I made a quick judgment that they must be approximately 100 foot in their wingspan. And the first uh, unit or first craft uh, flew at a higher altitude than the last. And of course, this is completely reversed from our normal uh, flight patterns. I had a good fix with Mount Adams, and I thought I'd try to clock their speed between Mount Rainier and Mount Adams. Arnold estimated the speed of the craft at an astounding 1,700 miles per hour, nearly three times faster than any jet he had ever heard of. He was asked by a reporter to describe the mysterious objects. You know, they would skip and sail and, and give off these flashes, and uh, you take a saucer and you skip it across the water, and it, it's erratic, and this is how the name Flying Saucer was born. This was the day, June 24th, 1947, that marked the beginning of what is known as the modern flying saucer era. What followed would be thousands upon thousands of unidentified flying objects over North America as well as other parts of the world. It seemed to hover for a matter of maybe one or two seconds, and then uh, was out of sight within, within two or three seconds, which was uh, a lot faster than it had been traveling originally. We were uh, using our red lights and our um, aircraft landing lights, which is a spotlight, and pointing them or directing them at the UFO. And it was reacting to it audibly on occasion. And uh, it did make a movement towards the lights. As we turned the light off, then it would return to its original position and remain stationary again. But it was reactive to the lights. I judged it to be at least 150 feet across it. It was um, saucer shaped with a high dome. It's very shiny under underneath. It was a porcelain type finish. And I was getting a tremendous shock all over my whole body. My hair was standing up and I had electrical static feeling over my hair on my arms and uh, my head. I thought it was doomsday. He was standing at the doorway screaming at me to get up. we got to get out of here. It's going to get us. And then I looked out there, and it was pitch black when I first looked. And by now, he's got a hold of me, and he's shaking me, and he's screaming at me, which Bill doesn't scream. I mean, he's just hysterical is the way I can explain the way he was. And he keeps telling me, we've got to get the kids out of here. It's going to get us. And I didn't see anything. So I, I looked again, and all of a sudden, I saw this real, like a real bright light. And I still didn't know what I was looking at. I didn't know what, what had scared him. But after looking at the way he was and looking at what I saw, I knew I'd better listen to him. So I went down the hallway and grabbed my daughter. And I came back to the hallway and went out the front door. And he had grabbed our son by then. When he came back up the second time, I felt like death was at hand. I figured this was it. And as soon as it touched down, then the whole area just lit up. You couldn't see anything inside, but you could see the outline of the whole object. It was the going through the sky, not really, it didn't seem to be going really fast. After a while, it, it just started straight up in the air. They were about four feet ten, um, had very large heads, uh, no hair on their heads, um, no eyebrows, no, no whiskers or anything like that. They uh, had very large eyes. The odor itself, I smelled stronger when the beings were near me. And when they looked at me, we did not talk uh, verbally like we're talking now. It was a telepathy type thing. A recent Gallup poll estimates that one out of every two Americans believe in the existence of UFOs. Over 15 million people have reported seeing UFOs, of which over 2,000 were encounters with landed UFOs and their occupants. UFOs have been fired upon by jet fighters and anti-aircraft missiles, but with no effect. They give off powerful electromagnetic charges, often causing the breakdown of engines and electrical circuitry. They evoke strange and fearful reactions in animals and frequently cause profound psychological disturbances in humans. They have the ability to materialize as if from nowhere, but more often, vanish into thin air in the midst of a sighting. Both human eyes and radar instruments have observed unbelievable aerial maneuvers, such as 90-degree turns of several thousand miles per hour, 
and have been clocked at speeds up to 16,000 miles per hour. There can be no longer any doubt, even to the most ardent skeptic, that UFOs exist. The question is, where do they come from? If they come from another galaxy, then they would come from at least two million light years away. Even traveling at light speed, 186,000 miles per second, it would take two million years to get here. But suppose that UFOs come from some distant star in our own galaxy. If these space visitors were to travel one million miles a day, it would take 70,000 years to reach the Earth from the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, which is 25 and a half trillion miles from Earth. Other stars are thousands of times further out in space. Conservative estimates indicate that a spaceship carrying 10 people and traveling five light years to and from a nearby star system at 70% of the speed of light would consume 500,000 times the amount of energy used in the United States in one year. But there are other complications of space travel. Space is not a vacuum, but contains cosmic gas, dust, and particles. Nobel Prize winner Professor Edward Purcell of Harvard points out that a space vehicle traveling at the speed of light would collide with this space material in the form of radiation and with the impact of several hundred atom smashers. On the afternoon of January 7, 1948, an unidentified flying object was sighted over Godman Air Force Base at Fort Knox, Kentucky. The base tower sent four F-51 jets to investigate. The flight leader, Captain Thomas F. Mantell, reported seeing the object, and at 3.15 p.m., he broke away from the formation in pursuit of the object. A few moments later, he radioed the tower. I'm closing in now to take a good look. It's directly ahead and above, and still moving at about half my speed. The thing looks metallic and of tremendous size. I'm going up to 20,000 feet, and if I'm no closer, I'll abandon chase. Those were the last words that Captain Mantell ever spoke. Later in the day, his body was found in a nearby field, the wreckage of his plane scattered for half a mile around. There were many other sightings that year. In July 1948, it was reported from Strategic Air Command in San Antonio to FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover that an unidentified aircraft was seen by an Eastern Airlines pilot co-pilot and one or more passengers flying over Montgomery, Alabama. The aircraft was reported to be of an unconventional type, without wings, and resembled generally a rocket ship of the type depicted in comic strips. It was reported to have had windows, to have been larger than the Eastern Airlines plane, and to have been traveling at an estimated speed of 2,700 miles per hour. It narrowly missed a collision with the Eastern Airlines plane. And from an FBI memorandum dated March 14, 1949, comes this report. Flying disks are believed by the Air Force to be man-made missiles rather than some natural phenomenon, and that as much as four years ago, it was learned that some type of flying disks were being experimented upon by the Russians. It was further determined that most all of the flying disks seen by persons in the United States approached this country from a northerly direction and returned in the same direction, indicating a strong possibility that they are coming from Russia. On the evening of July 19, 1952, Senior Air Controller Harry G. Barnes at National Airport in Washington, D.C., picked up seven slow-moving objects on his radar scope. He called Andrews Air Force Base and learned that they were seeing the identical blips on their radar. A pair of F-94 Air Force jets were soon searching the skies over Washington, where they found nothing. As soon as the jets departed, the blips reappeared on radar screens and remained there until daybreak. A week later, Harry Barnes picked up 10 more objects on radar. Andrews Air Force Base confirmed that the same unknown objects were on their radar scopes as well. Barnes called the Pentagon, and another pair of jets came howling over Washington. But now the UFOs remained visible on the screens, 
and one of the jet fighters reported a visual sighting of four lights. At one point, the pilot radioed that the lights were surrounding his plane. But soon, the UFO sped away and disappeared into the night. Later that morning, Harry Barnes made this statement, quote, there is no other conclusion that I can reach but that for six hours on the morning of the 26th of July, there were at least 10 unidentifiable objects moving above Washington. They were not ordinary aircraft, nor in my opinion could any natural phenomena account for these spots on our radar." End quote. The Pentagon was inundated with questions from the press, and President Harry Truman asked Secretary of Defense Forrestal to find out what in the world, or out of it, was going on. On October 27, 1952, the FBI issued this memorandum. Air intelligence still feels flying saucers are optical illusions or atmospherical phenomena. But some military officials are seriously considering the possibility of interplanetary ships. Investigative journalist Frank Edwards, author of Flying Saucers, Serious Business, offers the following commentary. This is Frank Edwards reporting. How real are the flying saucers, officially called unidentified flying objects? On December 24, 1959, the Inspector General of the Air Force notified all air base commanders that flying saucers are a serious problem. The government of the United States has issued orders advising the military how to recognize the UFOs, how to report them, and how to handle fragments of them. Slowly but surely, the nature and extent of this remarkable phenomenon has become public knowledge. By patiently piecing together these bits of evidence as they become available, by carefully weighing the guarded statements of scientists and military agencies involved in the study of unidentified flying objects, we shall see that they are indeed serious business. The variety of witnesses of UFOs is endless. They include military personnel from the Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps, radar specialists, aeronautical engineers, airport traffic controllers, astronomers, FBI agents, state, county, and city police, pilots and crews from American, United, Eastern, Pan American, Northwest, Western, and TWA were also on the list of witnesses. Millions in the United Kingdom, France, Australia, South America, Mexico, and other nations around the world have seen UFOs. For 18 years, the late Dr. J. Allen Hynek headed up the Air Force investigation into UFOs called Project Blue Book and was acknowledged to be the world's foremost authority on UFOs. After amassing a computer bank of over 63,000 sightings, he states, The UFO phenomenon is truly a phenomenon of our times. It is an extremely puzzling one and calls forth a wide spectrum of opinions. No matter what one may think about UFOs, no matter what one may believe about them, whether it is all nonsense or whether they represent something very, very real, three facts stand out, three facts which no one can deny. The first is that UFO reports exist. Secondly, that UFO reports come from all over the world. And the third is that many are made by highly responsible people, often scientifically trained. We scientists have no positive proof yet of the origin or even of the reality of these strange reported craft but we do know that the reports themselves are very real. To find the answer to this magnificent scientific puzzle, the UFO phenomenon, we need to approach it with a truly open mind so we can explore all possible avenues of explanation. Among those who claimed to have seen UFOs was Senator Barry Goldwater, who said, quote, flying saucers, unidentifiable flying objects, or whatever you want to call them, are real, end quote. Astronaut Gordon Cooper said, quote, I believe these extraterrestrial vehicles and their crews are visiting this planet from other planets, and they're obviously a lot more technically advanced than we are here on Earth." End quote. Prince Philip of England is a flying saucer fanatic. He meticulously charts all important saucer sightings on a gigantic wall map in his private study at Buckingham Palace. General Douglas MacArthur was the supreme commander of all Allied forces in the South Pacific during World War II. 
He believed in UFOs and even commissioned a report that was over 20,000 pages long. During one of his last speeches to the cadets at West Point, he said, Gentlemen, the next war will not be an international war, but an intergalactic war. He assumed that not only were there UFOs from another planet, but that they were hostile. One fall evening in 1969, Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter was preparing for a speech in the little town of Leary when he spotted a bright object in the western sky. Carter describes his experience. There were about 20 of us standing outside of a little uh, restaurant, I believe, a high school uh, lunchroom, and a, a kind of a green light appeared in the western sky. This was right after sundown. And uh, it got, got brighter and brighter. And then eventually it disappeared. It was not, didn't have any uh, solid substance to it. It was just a, a very peculiar looking light. None of us could uh, understand what it was. Former President Ronald Reagan made statements concerning UFOs on 18 different occasions while in office. The following is an excerpt from one of his speeches. I've often wondered, what if all of us in the world discovered that we were threatened by an outer a power from outer space, from another planet? Wouldn't we all of a sudden find that we didn't have any differences between us at all? After leaving the White House, Reagan admitted to having seen a UFO while he was governor of California. He was aboard the governor's plane at the time. His wife, Nancy, as well as several other people, also saw it and described it as a green, glowing UFO. They chased it for some 300 miles before it went out of the plane's range. On November 7, 1975, an alarm went off at Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana, the site of launching facilities for Minuteman missiles. A sabotage alert team immediately went to the site where they saw a glowing orange disk the size of a football field hovering over the area. It began to rise, and the North American Air Defense Command radar picked it up when it reached an altitude of 1,000 feet. Two F-106 jet fighters were dispatched from Great Falls, Montana to intercept the craft. But before the fighters arrived, it disappeared from the radar screens. The next day, there were more sightings, both visual and radar, over the base. Each time the jets screamed into the area, the UFOs shut off their lights and reappeared only after the jets left. In the next eight months, 130 similar reports were logged at the base and in the surrounding county. An early and prominent champion of UFOs was one Donald E. Kehoe, a U.S. Naval Academy graduate and retired Marine Corps major. In the January 1950 issue of True Magazine, he wrote a comprehensive article on UFOs. It caused an instant sensation and became one of the most widely read and discussed articles of the day. He claimed that none of his high-level sources would talk about UFOs which he took as powerful evidence that something tremendously important was being covered up. This is not an attack on the Air Force spokesman or the project spokesman. They are simply following orders to explain away all UFO sightings as quickly as possible when they become public and deny that UFOs really exist. We have not been hiding anything. The investigations have been made public the explanations of those where there is a clear explanation have been made public. He later became director of the National Investigation Committee on Aerial Phenomena, where he questioned many governmental agencies about their possible involvement or knowledge of UFOs. The following is an excerpt of a letter from the FBI in answer to one of Major Kehoe's inquiries. In response to your letter of September 22, 1958, this bureau does not have information on unidentified flying objects which can be released. This does not imply that this bureau has information concerning unidentified flying objects which cannot be released. Possible communications with extraterrestrial vehicles from another planet, should the unidentified flying object prove to be an extraterrestrial, is not a function of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Signed, John Edgar Hoover, director of the FBI. 
there are six distinct categories of sightings. Close encounters of the first kind refers to a mere sighting of an unidentified flying object. Close encounters of the second kind includes both the sighting of a UFO as well as tangible proof of the craft having been there, such as marks on the ground, the scorching of grass, or the interference of electrical circuits. Close encounters of the third kind is the direct confrontation with a space being or entity sometimes called a humanoid. Close encounters of the fourth kind involved alleged abductions by UFOs, where people claim to be involuntarily taken on board a UFO, usually for experimental purposes. Close encounters of the fifth kind involve contactees or those persons who claim to be in personal contact with UFO entities, usually through metaphysical or occult means. Close encounters of the sixth kind include injuries or deaths resulting from a UFO close encounter. One of the greatest waves of UFO sightings in modern history came in 1965 with more than 500 cases reported during the summer months alone. One such case was near Ann Arbor, Michigan, where 50 people and 12 police officers in three counties reported having seen objects flashing across the pre-dawn skies. That evening, 87 female students at Hillsdale College near Ann Arbor watched an object flying around and flashing bright lights for a period of about four hours. Life magazine said, Call them what you will, flying saucers, unidentified flying objects, or optical illusions. They are back again and seen by more people than ever before. Last week, the manifestation seemed almost to have reached the proportions of an invasion. In Washington, House Minority Leader Gerald Ford called for a full-blown investigation. Thus, the first congressional hearings on UFOs began as a closed-door session on April 5, 1966. Their conclusion was that a major university be given the job of researching the UFO phenomena. The job was given to the University of Colorado, and Edward Condon, professor of physics, would serve as chairman of the group. After much research, a 1,465-page report was completed by 36 authors at a cost of more than half a million dollars. The report was summed up under the section titled Conclusions and Recommendations. It states, Our general conclusion is that nothing has come from the study of UFOs in the past 21 years that has added to scientific knowledge. Careful consideration of the record leads us to conclude that further extensive study of UFOs probably cannot be justified in the expectations that science will be advanced thereby. On April 17, 1966, Sheriff's deputies Dale Spower and Wilbur Neff had just investigated an accident when they noticed a glowing object about a thousand feet above the ground in eastern Ohio. They then began pursuit at speeds of nearly 90 miles an hour. The third officer, Wayne Houston, was listening to their radio and joined the chase. 85 miles later, they pulled into a service station for refueling, where they met patrolman Frank Panzanella, who had also been tracking the UFO. The officers all stood together, watching the object hover to the east. At that point, the object shot upward at great speed and disappeared. Project Blue Book was called in to investigate. The official Air Force version was that at least five experienced police officers, one of them a veteran air crewman, had conducted an hours-long high-speed chase of the planet Venus. For more than 20 years, from 1948 through 1969, the United States Air Force was in charge of investigating UFO reports. The first study established in 1948 was called Project Sign. Its conclusions were that UFOs were real and estimated them to be interplanetary craft. The Pentagon rebuked the report, calling it science fiction fantasy. The next report, called Project Grudge, was established in early 1949 and would proceed in secrecy. 
The critics of this investigation complain that the Air Force wanted to control all research on UFOs and that its mandate seemed to deny or explain away all sightings. Project Grudge did not last long and was officially dissolved in December of 1949. However, there had been many recent UFO sightings in New Mexico, so the Air Force launched a new study known as Project Twinkle. An observation post was set up in New Mexico and was armed with cameras, telescopes, and other optical equipment. They waited and waited, and after a year of frustration, the Air Force terminated Project Twinkle. It was not long after this that the government began a new policy of cooperation with the press by issuing regular releases about sightings and investigations. This was followed by a boom year of over 1,500 reports in 1952. The Air Force then established a task force codenamed Project Blue Book, which was to become the most systematic of all studies done by the Air Force. Witnesses received an eight-page questionnaire Photographs were analyzed and field interviews were conducted. Investigators monitored aircraft flights and checked weather records. On the whole, the Project Blue Book team successfully weeded out UFO reports that were obvious hoaxes or those that could be attributed to natural phenomena. However, for those cases that remained unsolved, investigators had two choices. Admit that they had failed to identify the object or embrace any remotely feasible explanation. Project Blue Book was terminated in 1969. It concluded that little, if anything, has come from the study of UFOs, and that the least likely explanation of UFOs is the hypothesis of extraterrestrial visitations by intelligent beings. On the evening of October 25, 1973, a young Pennsylvania farmer, Stephen Pulaski, and at least 15 other witnesses saw a bright object hovering over a field near them. Stephen grabbed his rifle and went to investigate. It was then that he noticed something walking along by the fence. They were hairy and long-armed, with greenish-yellow eyes, and a smell like burning rubber was present. Stephen sensed that these creatures were not friendly and fired a tracer bullet over their heads. And when they kept on coming, he fired directly at one of them. The creatures then all disappeared into the woods, and the glowing object disappeared from the field instantaneously. UFO researchers, as well as a state trooper, were called in to investigate. When they arrived, the people there told them that Stephen had been growling like an animal and flailing his arms. His own dog ran toward him, and Stephen attacked the dog. Stephen then collapsed, and after a time, began to come to his senses. The entire group commented, on the nauseating, sulfur-like odor that was present. One of the earliest references to a spacecraft is probably that found in an ancient Egyptian account, some 1,500 years before Christ. One of the characteristics of that craft was the foul odor that emitted from it. The Amityville Horror was based on a factual account of what happened to a family in Amityville, New York. An irritating and nauseating odor seemed to accompany the presence of the ghost or spirit entity that entered there from time to time. Whitley Stryber wrote of his abduction experiences in his book, Communion. He said he could smell their presence and that it smelled like sulfur. On October 11th, 1973, Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker were fishing when a strange craft descended and hovered near them. Parker passed out, and Hickson was paralyzed, but was able to continue observing what was happening. Two entities then emerged from the craft and picked Hickson up by his arms and carried him inside the ship, where he was thoroughly examined. He was then taken back to where they had been fishing on the riverbank. When the two fishermen went to the sheriff's office to report their story, they were interrogated and then left alone in a room with a hidden microphone. The recording of their conversation revealed that both men were quite frightened by their experience. The emotional trauma had been so great to Parker that after Hickson left the room, he began to pray. Ultimately, he suffered a nervous breakdown as a result of his experience. In the spring of 1959, UFOs brought panic to Soviet radar and Air Force personnel 
by hovering and circling for more than 24 hours above Zverdlovac, headquarters of a tactical missile command. Red fighter pilots were ordered airborne to chase the UFOs away, but later reported that the alien objects easily outmaneuvered their jets and zigzagged to avoid their machine gun fire. The Russian spacecraft Zalyut 6 returned to Earth in 1978 after 96 days in orbit. They told of a formation of UFOs which trailed them closely for three complete orbits around the globe. One of their cameras captured 20 minutes of incredible motion picture footage of this encounter. According to a previous mutual agreement, the Russians forwarded copies of the film to the United States to be analyzed. Unofficial statements from NASA state that it is the best motion picture footage ever filmed of UFOs. The foremost Russian authority on UFOs, Dr. Felix Zeigel, contends that UFOs may have frightened, harassed, and possibly even killed Russian cosmonauts on their missions. T minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6. On at least six space missions, United States astronauts have encountered UFOs. Journalist Frank Edwards records the following incident. As Major Cooper was making his final orbit of the Earth in May of 1963, he was approaching Perth, Australia. Suddenly, Major Cooper radioed down to the tracking station that he was being approached by a greenish glowing disk with a faint red glow on one side. It was traveling east to west which no man-made satellite does. 200 persons at the tracking station watched the object on the gear there. They saw it approach Cooper, then it veered away from him and sped on out into space. It was only the first of many such cases. Every American astronaut since Gordon Cooper has also been approached by unidentified flying objects. And each time the UFOs come closer to the astronauts, and each time they remain a little longer. In 1965, Major Edward McDivitt photographed one of these objects near the capsule in which he was orbiting the Earth over the Pacific Ocean. And the photograph, as released by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, clearly shows a bright egg-shaped thing which leaves a visible trail from its propulsion system. The more we study the evidence that is being assembled all over the Earth, the more inescapable the conclusion that man had best prepare himself for the greatest event in human history. The realization that we are about to contact or to be contacted by sentient beings from elsewhere in the universe. The late General Douglas MacArthur said that this confrontation would be the greatest challenge man ever had to face. Are we ready for it when and if it comes? Frank Edwards reporting. Gemini 5, 10, and 11 have all had similar encounters. So convinced was astronaut Edgar Mitchell of the existence of UFOs that he retired from the U.S. space program to devote full time to UFO investigation. During our first mission to the moon, Mission Control recorded the following broadcast of strange noises that were heard on the Apollo 11 spacecraft. Says, UFOs have reportedly dogged the U.S. space program since the very beginning. 
UFO researchers claim that NASA's own logs show that virtually all of the early Gemini and Apollo missions encountered UFOs. NASA has explained most of these sightings as space debris or solar flares, but some of its own astronauts have disagreed. UFO sightings have been reported by James Lovell, James McDivitt, Wally Schirra, Deke Slayton, Gordon Cooper, and others. In March 1989, some strange transmissions occurred during a space flight. A Maryland ham radio operator picked up the voice of Discovery pilot Colonel John Blaha speaking on a secret NASA channel. Dr. J. Allen Hynek explains one alternative theory that we might be dealing with something from another dimension. One of the most intriguing aspects of UFO sightings is their apparent isolation in space and time. Sightings are usually made in one place at a time and last for short periods, sometimes appearing out of nowhere and vanishing into nowhere. This is much more suggestive of a parallel reality than, let's say, visits from some faraway planet in which case we might expect them to stick around for a while. The British journal Flying Saucer Review was established in 1955 and is widely recognized as the leading UFO publication in the world. It's authored by over 50 experts worldwide who conduct major UFO investigations. Yet an official statement by editor Gordon Creighton is most amazing. Quote, there seems to be no evidence yet that any of these craft or beings originate from outer space, end quote. Close encounters of the fourth kind are by far the most frightening. Those who claim to have been abducted by aliens and taken against their will. Perhaps the most famous case was that of Betty and Barney Hill. Their story began on the night of September 19, 1961 as they were returning to their New Hampshire home from a vacation in Canada. They saw a distant point of light which seemed to move erratically. As it moved closer, it became more intense. Betty Hill remembers. This craft left the top of the mountain, came out of the highway and stopped in midair. Barney took the binoculars and started out of the car in an attempt to identify the craft. And as he did this, he saw a group of figures standing in the windows looking down at him. One was saying to him, don't be afraid, keep looking, keep looking, stay there. Don't be afraid, no harm's going to come to you, but stay there. And the craft started to descend. And Barney ran back to the car saying we had to get out of there, they were going to capture us. And we took off speeding down the highway. They made it home without further incident, but in the days and months that followed, they experienced nightmares, flashbacks, and extreme anxiety. They were also unable to account for more than two hours between the time they first encountered the UFO and the time they reached home. Where had the missing time gone? What had happened? They sought out a psychiatrist, and through hypnosis, Betty and Barney Hill narrated a tale much stranger than the one that had been lodged in their conscious minds. Body put on the brakes, the car motor died. They separated, came up on each side, took us out, took us in a path through the woods, took us on board, gave us physical examinations. We were being kidnapped. Betty Hill remembers being able to offer a detailed description of her alien abductors. They're all shot. The leader, I would say, was my height, or may, just a little taller than I am, and I'm five foot. They were bald, no hair, no eyebrows, no eyelashes, and no earlobes, no ear, you know, we could say. Very large eyes, very small, flat nose, thin slit for mouth. Betty Hill said that they were most interested in human sexuality and that they communicated through a form of telepathy that sounded like a voice loud and clear inside their heads. Bud Hopkins has written several books on UFOs, including Missing Time and Intruders. He is one of the foremost experts on abduction cases, 
otherwise known as close encounters of the fourth kind. And now we've come to the conclusion that abduction of their involvement with human beings, that this is the center of the entire UFO uh, phenomenon, yeah. and that actually when people have UFO sightings, it's very possible that what they're seeing is something on its way to or from an abduction of somebody. <laughs> they're not just flying around up there, they are interested very profoundly in human beings. Whitley Stryber claims to have been abducted by alien beings on more than one occasion and wrote of his experiences in his best-selling book, Communion. I've had, since I wrote Communion, over 55,000 letters from people around the world who've had this similar things that think they have happened to them, and we still get about 200 a week. The Intruders Foundation and the Fund for UFO Research show that one out of every 50 American adults, 3.7 million people, indicate that they may have had an abduction experience with an unidentified flying object. I remember my mother was taken in a jeep and that I was there with a, uh, a UFO. There was a beam of light that came down and I was beamed onto the ship. These experiences sound crazy. It sounds impossible. It, it is impossible according to our physics, but we often use hypnosis to help flesh out all the, the recollections. A top scientist, Dr. Leo Sprinkle, conducted a five-year study of 82 persons who reported UFO experiences. Most of them were able to relive the experience through hypnosis, and all suffered severe psychological disturbances afterwards. They claimed to have been taken inside spaceships and examined by humanoids who communicated telepathic messages to them. Dave Hunt is an investigative journalist and has authored 18 books. His research and consulting expertise takes him around the world. Cal State University, Long Beach. And again, I forget the names of the scientists there who were working on this, and this is a number of years ago now. They did research, and they took people at random. And unless you're going to say everybody's been abducted, uh, they took people at random and who had no such idea, no indication they'd ever been abducted. And they... Um, uh, hypnotized them, took them into a deep state, then suggested that they were being approached by a UFO, asked them to describe it. Their description <laughs> was the same <laughs> as the others. Uh, they suggested, you're being taken aboard. Or oh, what do the entities look like? and they came up with similar descriptions and then when they're taken aboard they're what's happening to you well, i'm getting a medical examination you know or in his book secrets of the ufos ufologist don elkins made the following observation i have found that some people can achieve the contact phenomenon simply by being hypnotized and the same general message permeates over 90 percent of the millions of words received by thousands of people around the world. No one knows what hypnosis is. No one knows what goes on in the mind. It's an altered state of consciousness like yogis and uh, witch doctors have been practicing. Uh, it loosens the normal connection between your spirit and your brain. And of course, if the hypnotist can control you, make all kinds of suggestions, make you think uh, things are happening that are not happening, make you think you have powers that you don't, experiences that you haven't, even implant memories. Uh, other beings, if there are other minds out there, they could also do the same thing. Sir John Eccles, Nobel Prize winner for his research on the brain, describes the brain as, quote, a machine that a ghost can operate, unquote. What he means by that is your spirit operates your brain in a normal state of consciousness, in an altered state, reached under yoga, a TM, hypnosis, uh, you have loosened the normal connection between your spirit and your brain, and that allows another spirit, other entities, other minds, to interpose themselves and begin to tick off the neurons in your brain, create a, a universe of illusion. I believe that it's demonic. I think all of the evidence indicates this. Some people claim that by allowing themselves to be put into an hypnotic trance, they are acting as a channeling device in which the extraterrestrial being speaks through them. The following is an actual sampling of those messages. 
We come from the Interplanetary Confederation of Solar Systems, and our purpose is to aid our brother man on the planet Earth as the new age dawns. The teacher that was known to you as Jesus was able to use many more of the abilities than the people of this planet. Unfortunately, man upon planet Earth has misinterpreted the meaning of this man's life. He was no different from any of you. He was simply able to remember certain principles. These principles may be realized by anyone at any time. It is only necessary that you avail yourself to our contact through meditation in order to begin to re-realize that which is rightfully yours, the truth of the creation and the truth of your position in it. Know ye not that ye are gods? We have been puzzled at times by the inability of the people in general of this planet to be awakened to this simple truth. We find that the state of hypnosis brought about by the evolution of thought of the people of this planet is so great that it is necessary for him to maintain a constant awareness of his spiritual nature with meditation. Man is now in the transitional period before the dawn of a new age. With peace, love, brotherhood, and understanding on man's part, he will see a great new era begin to dawn. In his book, Flying Saucer Pilgrimage, Bryant Reeves summarizes his findings in this statement. From our analysis, the teachings of the space beings appear to support many of the principles taught in Oriental philosophy by seers of the Far East. UFO researcher John Weldon then offers this question. How credible is it to think that literally thousands of genuine extraterrestrials would fly millions of light years simply to teach New Age philosophy, deny Christianity, and support the occult? And why would the entities actually possess and inhabit people just like demons do if they were really advanced extraterrestrials? Dr. Pierre Guerin, an eminent scientist associated with the French National Council for Scientific Research, concludes that UFO behavior is more akin to magic than to physics as we know it, and that modern UFO knots and the demons of past days are probably identical. The word demon in Greek comes from the root meaning knowledge or intelligence, implying that demons have access to knowledge and information denied to ordinary mortals. After what happened to me, the communion experiences, I decided that that might be a good idea to accept the idea of the devil just in case that's what I saw. If you look closely at the life of the world, you see the workings of evil in the world. There seems to be a sort of a machinery behind it that is far beyond just the accident of human life. You can literally <clears throat> hypnotize a person, tell them that there's a cat in their lap, they will see it, they will hear it, purr, they will pet it and feel it. It's not physically there. You tell the cat to scratch them, you know, and bring them out of it. There are scratch marks on their cheek. A non-physical object under the right conditions can leave physical evidence. Uh, I think it's demonic. <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's a spiritual power of some kind for which there is no physical explanation. It, that you can't explain it with the laws of chemistry and physics as we know it. John Keel is a world-renowned expert on UFOs and has written numerous books and articles on the subject. A self-described agnostic, he made this statement. Thousands of books have been written on the subject of demonology, which is the ancient and scholarly study of monsters and demons. The manifestations and occurrences described in this literature are identical to the UFO phenomenon. Victims of demonic possession suffer from the same medical and emotional symptoms as the UFO contactees. Death, I would say sense. I was assaulted by something from the unknown rather than possessed by it. I, don't, I hope that I was never possessed by it, although there are those who might disagree with me. And uh, I don't think it was something out of craziness. If it came out of my mind, it came out of a part of my mind that uh, is universal to us all. In Close Encounters of the Third Kind, that first film that came out about UFOs, 
house that the mother and, and little boy were living in, you know, the toys began running around and screws unscrewing them in the presence of UFOs. What the film was saying was the same people that run UFOs run haunted houses. And I would say that's absolutely true. In 1969, the United States Printing Office issued a 400-page publication entitled UFOs and Related Subjects, an Annotated Bibliography. The author was the senior bibliographer for the Library of Congress, Ms. Lynn E. Coteau. During her research, she read over 1,000 articles, books, and other literature. She summarizes her findings in the preface of the bibliography. A large part of the available UFO literature is closely linked with mysticism and the metaphysical. It deals with subjects like mental telepathy, automatic writing, and invisible entities, as well as phenomena like poltergeist manifestations and possession. Many of the UFO reports now being published in the popular press recount alleged incidents that are strikingly similar to demonic possession and psychic phenomena that have long been known to theologians and parapsychologists. This document was compiled for the United States Air Force and is now in the Library of Congress. Dr. Jacques Vallée has addressed the United Nations on UFOs and was the model for Lacombe in Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind. He is the author of eight books on UFOs and has been widely recognized as the premier investigating scientist in the realm of UFO research. In his book, Messengers of Deception, Vallée says, an impressive parallel can be made between UFO occupants and the popular conception of demons. And in his book, Confrontations, he writes, the medical examinations to which abductees are said to be subjected, often accompanied by sadistic sexual manipulation, is reminiscent of the medieval tales of encounters with demons. He also made this statement, I believe that when we speak of UFO sightings as instances of space visitations, we are looking at the phenomenon on the wrong level. We are not dealing with successive waves of visitations from space. We are dealing with a control system. And he states, UFOs are the means through which man's concepts are being rearranged. They are engaging in a worldwide enterprise of subliminal seduction. Jacques Vallée, is, at least at that time when he wrote that book, was an agnostic. Interesting that he comes to basically the same conclusions I do as a Christian from my research. And he said uh, about UFOs, they're real, but they're not physical. They're messengers of deception. And this was based on his research of about 20 years. They seem to be psychologically preparing, setting us up for some ultimate delusion that is too horrible even to imagine as yet. I would agree with that. Dr. I.D.E. Thomas is one of a long line of Welsh preachers. He is currently the senior pastor at the First Baptist Church of Maywood, California, and has authored several books which have enjoyed wide circulation. In his book, The Omega Conspiracy, Dr. Thomas explains the phenomenon of unidentified flying objects and offers an explanation that could identify the beings who operate them. As incredible as his explanation may sound, let us regard the ancient saying of Heraclitus, who 500 years before Christ said, because it is sometimes so unbelievable, the truth escapes becoming known. The answer to all this and the clue to this cosmic riddle may be found in the ancient book of Genesis. And back there in chapter six, we are told of a very amazing and bizarre event the sons of God saw the daughters of men and saw that they were beautiful and they lusted after them. And then we read they married them and sired children from them. For the past 1500 years, most scholars, including evangelical scholars, have interpreted the sons of God as the good sons of Seth and the daughters of men as the wicked daughters of Cain. They've adopted that interpretation because the other one is so bizarre and outlandish. The ancient interpretation, and in my opinion, the correct one, 
is that the sons of God were demonic beings or fallen angels, and that they came down to earth, they lusted after the daughters of men, they married them, and produced this amazing progeny, this hybrid progeny of the Nephilim. And the very word Nephilim does not mean giants. It comes from the root Nephal, fallen ones. The early Christian fathers in the first four centuries, men like Irenaeus, Tertullian, Ambrose, for 400 years they knew no other interpretation except that the sons of God were angelic beings. Uh, Josephus, the cosmopolitan Jewish historian, says the same thing. We read in the book of Job that when God laid the foundation of the earth, the sons of God shouted for joy. Obviously, the sons of God could not be human beings. Adam had not been created. If this was a case of just mixed marriages between good men and wicked women, it is surprising that God should have issued the fire of judgment that he did. God took this stern action of wiping out the human race. Now, the only family that were left intact in order to re-establish, repopulate the new world was the family of Noah. Noah, we are told, was perfect in his generations. The word perfect does not mean, in this case, morally perfect. Because we know from the story of Noah, and especially what happened after the flood, that Noah was not perfect. Uh, what it means is like a lamb uh, for the paschal sacrifice, that lamb had to be without blemish, uh, physically pure, without blemish. So it seems was the case of Noah, the only family that remained uncontaminated from these strange beings that appeared from space. Uh, the only line that was pure and clean from God's standpoint to start a new world and a new civilization. Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, so in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Of all the patriarchs and prophets of the Old Testament, the key to prophecy above all others, is Noah. And something happened in the days of Noah that was a distinctive characteristic of Noah's time that didn't happen before or after. Wars and famines and pestilences and natural disasters have always happened. But something happened in the days of Noah, and the most sinister and bizarre of all the things that happened was this intermarriage between the angelic race and the human race. And of course, the mastermind behind it all was another angel, a fallen angel, Lucifer. Now, we believe that as they came in those days, we may very well be on the edge of another invasion from outer space, that Satan will once again make another attempt, maybe the final assault, on the human race in order to wean men and women away from the worship of God. He has tried before, he will inevitably try again. And by seducing the human race, by sending these so-called entities from space, demonic beings, he will try to get people all over the world to worship him and to deprive God of the worship that is due to him. Fortunately, we know what the end result is going to be. But this final or omega assault that will come at the end of time may trigger the coming back of Jesus Christ to rescue his own. Satan has failed before, and the Bible predicts he will fail again. We are told quite emphatically in God's word that the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. Satan will make the attempt, but our God greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world.